On behalf of the lay community of St Benedict, I welcome you to this talk which was given on the 28th of February 2021 by Father Mark Sodi to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the lay community of St Benedict. I hope you enjoy it. Hey everybody, my name is Adam Simon, I'm leader of the lay community and I welcome you tonight in the name of the lay community to the second of our LCSB 50 talks. In um, we are celebrating 50 years this year. It's amazing to think that we're celebrating. And in order to mark it, we have some wonderful speakers. Uh, and tonight we're very grateful that Mark is here. And I'm going to pass straight over to Mike Woodward, who's going to introduce Mark. And thank you also to Mike, uh, who in his amazing way has managed to uh, put together tonight. So Mike, over to you. Right, well, we were gonna hear um, June Forrest, as, as, as you know, and we're continuing to pray for him in hospital. Um, and when that became um, clear in the course of last week, um, we clearly had a problem. Um, but I had very little hesitation in turning to uh, Father Mark to um, come and, 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 and talk to us in his place. Um, I know that Mark is very well used to filling big shoes because when he appeared as the Vicar of Abergwenny, he followed on the sudden death of a very adored man who had done heaps of things. Um, but in his own quiet way, Mark got on with making his, um, dare I say, Mark, and especially with the foundation in 2014 of possibly the first, um, you can choose your word really, new stroke mini stroke lay Benedictine community to liven up an English parish um, and certainly the very first in a Welsh parish as, as we are in Abergavenny. And it, it was a brilliant move for many reasons, not least because the church in Abergavenny is the remains of a Norman Benedictine priory founded from Le Mans uh, in 1087 and and erased or certainly uh, drastically remodeled 500 years ago. I soon got into praying with this little community, uh, mornings and e evenings on many occasions. And it's been a wonderful experience to do that over many years now with the faces changing, but the prayer always continuing. And the sense of standing in the same place as centuries of generations of, of prayers had done before us was very palpable for all of us and as was the sense of community that doing that together generated. Can't say I, I knew them really well, but, they, but I held them all in, in deep affection and uh, we keep up on social media to, to some extent. One is now a monk, one a nun, and one a vicar. And others continue to live out what they discovered and lived in Abergavenny in other ways. And it's always been an equal opportunities community with a female sub prior, two New Zealanders, a Frenchman invited to join, and even an English person or two. <laughs> After initial incomprehension, uh, the community won great support and brand recognition in the town. Um, to begin with, there was a little bit of a mystery to people what was actually going on, I think. Um, and, and Mark uh, led all this uh, with considerable aplomb. Um, I found him to be a very unflappable um, character. Uh, we've never yet managed to have the long evening with um, wine and port that we probably ought to have, um, but maybe one day. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to uh, share the screen if the technology will will work. Um, and uh, it's a it's a real privilege to. Uh, to be to be with you and to be able to share in your fiftieth uh, anniversary celebration, I'm going to say a few words of introduction, then kind of paint a bit of a historical background story before going into the into the subject itself. Um, I am secretary to the Committee of Anglican Religious Communities in England, which is the committee, which is the ground up community. There is also an advisory committee, which is a house 
a bishops committee, which is the top down body, which uh, as recently as a result of introduction of new canons in the Church of England, taking much closer control over the religious communities, principally, sadly to say, needing to do so because of the historical abuses that there have been in some Anglican communities. Uh, but this body, the Committee of Anglican Religious Communities, exists really to support the communities at ground level. And I will uh, say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, I was, as Michael said, the founder and first prior of the Holy World community. And my recently appointed successor, uh, Father John Connell, is with us this evening. And it's good to have, uh, have him with us. Um, Michael wasn't sure whether to call us new, lay, or I forget, I forget whether it was the third word. And the problem, I think, is that certainly in Anglicanism, the term new monastic community covers a whole range of things. Um, Esther Duval, whose work on Benedictine spirituality will be known to you, described us as the most authentic um, of the communities, because I think we tried while accepting that people's um, vows and promises were for a season, that we tried during that season to live uh, according to the traditional uh, rule of the community, or, or, or the way that traditional communities would have lived. So Archie is trying to promote uh, religious life within the Church of England, and it does this in a number of ways. It has a, a Twitter account, uh, which different uh, people host for a week at a time, either traditional religious, uh, tertiaries, uh, oblates, or, or, or people from the new uh, monastic communities, and through talking about their life in a week, giving an example of what uh, being a religious is, and hopefully encouraging, uh, encouraging people in uh, to the religious life. Aki also holds um, or hosts a, a stall at Greenbelt where people can chat with traditional religious and learn something about their life as well as share in the daily round of prayer uh, at, in the tent while at, at, um, at the festival. During the lockdown we've designed this website which gives details of all Anglican religious throughout the whole of the world. And um, it also says something about the life of religious within the Anglican communion. And if you want to find more out about the life of religious in the Anglican communion, um, you can uh, visit that site. The photograph you see on the home page is the photograph of the of the last uh, of three conferences we've had, the fourth one has had to be postponed because of COVID, where we've come together as traditional and new monastic communities uh, to see what it is we can share and what we can learn from each other and how we can go forward uh, uh, together. So some of you normally at this time on a Sunday evening might be watching Call the Midwife. Call the Midwife, of course, is based on uh, an Anglican order of nuns, the community of St. John the Divine, a community which is still uh, very much in existence. And I put this up because I think it's worth sharing with you, because many of you come from the Roman Catholic rather than the Anglican tradition and perhaps aren't aware that most Anglican religious orders came into being in the reign of Queen Victoria. And they came into being to fulfill a specific purpose, really, in, in Anglo-Catholic parishes where poverty was at its greatest. And many of them were nursing or teaching orders. And when that role ceased uh, to exist, their purpose in life kind of had to be handed back to God uh, to check out what they should do. This community uh, continued nursing in, in Deptford um, on an agency basis after the creation of the NHS. 
but that responsibility was taken over in Lewisham in uh, 1966 and in Poplar in 1978. And now the four remaining sisters have a house in Birmingham, where along with many other Anglican religious communities, they have become houses of retreat. But because of that, of course, they're not seen so much and so obviously in the community as they once were. And I hear again and again people saying, well, I didn't realize that you had monks and nuns in the Church of England. I think those were only to be found in the Roman Catholic Church. And that, of course, has affected and impacted on uh, the uh, encouragement of people to consider uh, joining religious life. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. So to the Holywell community, well, this is the Priory Church in Abergavenny that Andrew, um, sorry, that Michael spoke of in his introduction. I was appointed a vicar there and took up my post on the Feast of the Epiphany in 2012. My predecessors, the previous incumbent and his curate, had wanted to nurture something of the Benedictine tradition there and held what were known as monastic days, where if one day a month people could come and spend the whole day in the priory, maintaining the sevenfold office of prayer, going out to do some labore, either jobs around the church or just walking the streets to proclaim the gospel or perhaps helping the elderly do their gardens and eating rather sumptuous meals uh, in, the, in, the, in the course of the day. When I was appointed, the then Bishop of Monmouth was a monk himself, uh, Bishop Dominic Walker of the Oratory of the Good Shepherd. And he set me the challenge to try and pervade this Benedictine spirituality much more into the life um, of the parish. Shortly afterwards, we were left a property. Interestingly, the property we were left was part of the original priory estate. And I can picture now sitting in the garden at the vicarage in September of that year, 2012, with my then uh, associate priest and a lad who had been president of the Students' Union in the University in Newport when I was the chaplain there, who I brought to be facilities manager, discussing what we might do with this house when we came up with the idea of setting up a new uh, monastic community called then the Young Benedictines. After some discussion, it was obvious that the house wasn't really suitable um, for the purpose that we had in mind. The house nevertheless had fulfilled its role in giving us the stimulus uh, to do what we wanted to do. The thinking was that we would um, use another vicarage in the town, Holy Trinity Vicarage. And the plan was that I wouldn't be the prior, that we'd appoint someone to be the prior so that that person could concentrate on community life and live with the community in the community house. After two rounds of recruitment, we failed to find a candidate suitable. And so I said to the bishop, well, it's my baby, I better take it on. And so that's how I became the prior. And during the course of this talk, you will hear again and again the problems over recruitment. I think that is one of the two major problems of establishing the new monastic community, money being the other one. Michael said that we had, um, we, we had developed a good relationship with the local community. And I had, as a result of that, been able to find uh, them funding the community fairly early on, which helped with the process. So two years to set up the community, putting in place all the things that one needs to put in place for safeguarding, deciding what the constitution of the community would be, 
uh, what its charism would be, but really only having a, a skeleton of an outline, because I think it's impossible to create a rule and an ethos for a community until you have a community actually uh, to do that with. And so those early days were very much days of exploring and being open to the spirit uh, to see how we would be guided. But we were very definite that we would be following the rule of St. Benedict. And you see there uh, underneath the stool, a copy of the rule which would be given to every new member at their commissioning. A petrol cross to symbolize their service of Christ. Petrol cross, which you might recognize being similar to one worn by the Holy Father with the good shepherd leading the sheep and carrying those who can't be led, which is what we felt the community's role and purpose should be in Abergavenny. We decided uh, to not have traditional habits, to make the point really that we weren't traditional monks, but also because these polar shirts were much more practical for the kind of things we were going to do. Although, as you'll see later on in the slides, we did wear slightly more conventional stuff when at prayer. So this is the three of us who created uh, the community in the sense that we were the first community that put the flesh on the bones. This is us on retreat at Langasti uh, the day before the commissioning of the community. And Michael has mentioned that some have gone off to do other recognized ministries in the church. One of those is Samuel on the right. But I want to make the point that the community is an end in itself. I didn't see it as an apprenticeship for something else. The fact that people were setting time aside for God meant that in, that in itself was something happening. By being there, they were growing as disciples. However, that discipleship would show. And therefore, I didn't judge individuals or the community's success or failure, depending on whether people went on to recognize roles in the church. And Amy, who you see there in the middle, at least before COVID, was a barmaid in Abergavenny. I don't know what God has in mind for her in the future, but for the moment, she hasn't taken on a recognized role within the church. That doesn't make her any the less uh, a satisfied uh, and a full uh, member of the community who has benefited from her uh, two years uh, with us. It soon became obvious that I couldn't run the community and the parish and so the ginger-haired person sitting next to me is the female deacon that Andrew, uh, that Michael, why do I keep calling you Andrew, Michael, uh, that Michael referred to, uh, who became the sub-prior within two months of the creation of the community. A year later, we were joined by another two lay members. The community's capacity was for four lay and two um, stipendiary. Um, the stipendiary two, being the stability, if you like, with the lay members coming and going, as Michael said. We asked people to sign up for a minimum of 12 months and discouraged them from staying for more than 24 months. This in the main, because I knew from my time as a university chaplain, that young people, if they find somewhere that they like, where they will stay there, and the danger is that they will get into a rut. And I saw this very much as not a lifelong commitment. And therefore, after a period of time, they would need to have discerned what God was calling them uh, to do next. As mentioned, the community has, has at its heart its worship meeting every morning at 8.15 for Lords, and most mornings followed by the Mass. And then we would breakfast together, even though the clergy lived apart from the lay members. We would meet for sex to 12, and then lunch together, 
and we would meet again for Vespers at 4.30 and have supper together. All those acts of worship were, all those offices were said in the Priory Church and were open uh, for other people to join us. But I felt very early on that there was a need for the community to have at least one time in the day where it prayed as a community. And so Compline was said privately in the community house at the end of the day. I said Mass followed Lord's most days because on a Wednesday we would have Mass a little later in order to have a time of Lectio Divina and on Saturday a little later in order to read the rule. We would meet as a community on a Tuesday evening partly for those things that communities need to, to meet about, to plan the week ahead, to get off your chest any grudges that you might have, any irritations that other members of the community with whom you're living in close proximity uh, need to be aware of your frustrations, but also a time of, of study. But the community was meant to also have a role in terms of its outreach into the local community. Those of you who know Abergavenny will on the surface realise that it looks to be a very prosperous place and so it is but it also has the poorest wards in Monmouthshire. Now I know that's not saying that they're very poor but nevertheless the juxtaposition of poverty and wealth resulted in quite marked um, social deprivation issues, uh, drug abuse, some alcohol abuse, um, and so there was a need for work in the community. The Holywell community led a parent and guardian, a parent guardian toddler group every Tuesday morning which had about uh, two dozen at it, a mixture of free play and biblically based uh, crafts and scriptures. We worked with an ecumenical drop-in centre for teenagers, providing a place for them, but also aware that the lonely elderly needed somewhere to go. And so we provided a, a games afternoon. We assisted at what was called crafty women, a lot, an opportunity for women to come together to do craft, but the principal purpose was for them to have company as well as to do the craft. So outreach was very much part of the, of the life of the community in all its various guises. I'm going to share a little video with you now, if I may, of a report produced by ITV Wales uh, to save you hearing just my voice solely and seeing my face only. Well, now for something completely different, as they say. For the past two years, Benedictine monks have been living in a monastery set up in Abergavenny. It's the revival of a tradition that started some thousand years ago. And if you're imagining elderly men wearing brown cassocks and living in a drafty old abbey, you couldn't be more wrong. As Lorna Pritchard has been finding out. <laughs> This is how you'd expect to find monks, peacefully singing their daily prayers. But half an hour later, it's a very different story. These are modern day monks. Well, I think there are preconceptions of what monks are like, dressed very conservatively, are very introverted in character, and actually that's not what we're like at all. Here we are, out in hoodies, uh, dressed comfortably, I'm very extroverted in what we do, really. That includes running a mother and toddler group here in Abergavenny. They're very, very lovely, really enthusiastic, a little bit crazy, but in a nice way. And telling children that saints are a lot like superheroes. If any of you recognise the guy above my head, but they, they expect you to sort of be hiding away in a church, not really doing anything, um, which is sort of pretty much the opposite of what we do. We try and be as out in the community as we can be. And when it is time to go home, it's not to a monastery, but a modern day house share. Living and cooking together, it could be mistaken for a student house, except for the music. 
and there are no late night parties. What finishes the day off is uh, the Office of Compline, which will play in the chapel here at home, and that's usually at half past nine, after which is the greatest silence when no one can speak or anything, and then we go to, we go to bed until Lord's the next morning. This modern monastery has inspired others to take up a similar way of life. Who knows? Monks might be living next door to you. Lorna Pritchard, ITV News, Abigail Burnham. I put this picture up because it's one that Michael took. Uh, and th that, that aspect of, of um, leading a prayerful life and doing outreach, I thought was one of the um struggle points within the community really because many people who are drawn to religious communities tend to be in the main somewhat introvert and the need for that extrovertness of going out and doing mission uh, was one of the struggles uh, we had with our with with our, with our uh, members both lay and ordain. Michael said some nice things about me, but I'm basically an introvert who hates public speaking and hates being at the forefront of anything. I'd much rather be uh, skulking in, 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 the, in, in the background. Yes, the community is there for Prince, Bishop and Pauper, Bishop Rowan Williams, the uh, visitor of the, of the community. But in addition to doing that um, outreach work, that good work, if you like, we also very overtly uh, preach the gospel. And so on a Monday, Thursday, you would see us on the railway station in Abergavenny, not washing uh, people's feet, but polishing their shoes on, the, on their way to work. Or on Ash Wednesday in the high street where you could step in under the gazebo uh, to a place of holy sp spiritual solitude and after a moment or two uh, be ashed. The community gave us the opportunity to take out the good news both in practical terms but also in the actuality of, 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 preaching, of preaching the gospel. And at Christmas, we had a, a walking uh, nativity. Again, another opportunity uh, uh, to do just that. Michael has mentioned that we were international in nature. In that photograph, you have two New Zealanders and a Frenchman. And yes, that Englishman he spoke of. Um, the one nearest the altar, Sebastian, is currently at Murfield, where he is um, undergoing a time of discernment to see whether he will uh, join the community um, there. And Michael mentioned you know, what some of our alumni have gone on to do. Not, as I said, that I see this as a test of success or failure, but Samuel, there it is, um, deaconing, wearing a stole which you will see it has on the corner of, of his shoulder, the symbol of the Holy World community. Now a very uh, faithful priest in um, Mega in Southeast, in Southeast Wales. On the left of this picture is our first Episcopal visitor, Bishop Richard Payne. Um, and in the middle is, um, Novice Joanna, who is uh, uh, um, a novice at the convent at Timaur, having been with us. And this is on the day she was uh, robed as a novice. And my mouse has decided to stop playing. Oh, yeah, it's going, it's going all funny things now. And uh, Adrian is um, at Mucknell Abbey. He uh, this photograph of, is of him uh, at, on the day he took his simple vows. I have two stories there about Joanna and, and Adrian, which I think say something about the view of religious in life today and why perhaps we can help um, religious uh, um, traditional communities with their recruitment. 
uh, a lady in Abergavenny said to Joanna, why is a nice girl like you wasting your life by going into a convent? Adrian, parishioners from his sending parish in Hertfordshire, recognised something about him, but they didn't know about the religious life and neither did Adrian. So they assumed that he was called to the ordained life. Within a month of joining the Holy Well community, Adrian knew that that was what God was calling him to. His very, the very experience of it, conf experience of it confirmed him um, in, that, in that certainty. So I like to think that we can work together the traditional um, and the new monastic. The handbook of religious life produced by the advisory council says that the goal is resurrection and not survival. And I know this is a very sensitive area, so I apologize not for quoting directly from the handbook when it says, the vocation of a community is always to seek to be obedient to the will of God, as well as being faithful to the charism of its founding member and to the spirit of its rule. Each community is to be altered and be alert in order to be altered to the sign of the times and to be continually searching to follow will in the age in which we are living. The reality of the present time seems to be that many communities will have fulfilled the purpose for which they were founded. Falling numbers and the lack of aspirants may reduce a community to such a small size that there is no hope of recovery. And sadly, some Anglican religious communities have had to fold, but they've used their resources in order to encourage new forms of monasticism. The Cowley Fathers funds can be called upon. A convent in, um, in the east of the country is now used by a new monastic community, uh, having taken part in a, in, in a, in a kind of um, a dragon's den scenario one of the communities was chosen to be given this property to carry out its life in. And so I think the future of the religious communities in the Anglican Communion is one, which we, one that will prosper, but it will prosper, I suggest, because old and new are learning to work together um, side by side. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Father Mark. That was deeply fascinating. And I learned a lot of things that I um, didn't know about the community in that. It was very enlightening. Thank you very much. And, and I've never seen that piece of film before either. Although I kind of got used to them being film crews being around because you had that kind of drawing power, I think, anyway. Um, and, I, and I think that's another dichotomy in a sense, really, because um, we, we were not enclosed and so we were much more able perhaps to have that higher, that higher profile and, and something, being something new is, brings that media interest as well. We're about to launch a new monastic community based in an old Cistercian Abbey here at Worley in this diocese and that's had an amazing amount of publicity. Great, yeah, and um, we've got, we got Plenty of time for questions. I just wonder if you, if you might be able to to say um, something before we move to the questions, um, just about the expressions, potential expressions and actual expressions of, um, if you like, the, the monastic spirit that you've seen developing, perhaps within the Anglican, the Anglican community and even outside, um, as, as you've gone about your your role. Um, is there anything you could say about that? Yes, I, 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 I think people of all churchmanships recognise and value the, the ability to retreat and see the religious communities as an indispensable resource in, 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 in that direction. And so that has been uh, recognised within the communion as a, as, as a valuable thing. And, and, and you know, that... 
that may seem strange to some of you Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, but in, in Anglicanism, because of the breadth of it, to actually have people who are much more on the kind of charismatic uh, lower church wing to recognize the, the, the beauty of that is, is, is something quite special and quite dynamic. And significant in all of this, of course, is the role of the current Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, on the day the Holy Well community came into being, he announced he was going to create a new monastic community at Lambeth, the St. Anselm community. And he listed uh, the increase and the growth in terms of breadth and depth of the religious life within the Anglican communion as one of the principal goals of his archiepiscopacy. And he has been faithful and true to, uh, to that uh, through the, the years that he's been in post. And I just wonder if, if you've got any clues how coming out of the pandemic um, experience might be a, a spur, an obstacle, anything you can see, very hard to say for definite, obviously, but any, any indications you've not noticed? Um, I, I, I can't give anything factual, I think, but the, my, my gut feeling, my sort of in my water, if you like, is that I think uh, whenever the, 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 the gates open and we go back to whatever normal life is, people will not want to be in the large crowds and busyness that they were in before. Mm. I think there will be a fear. Um, and, but I also believe that there will be some people who have appreciated some of the, the quietness and the solitude of, of lockdown and may want to re-engage with that from time to time. And, and, and I think that could be a, could, could be a positive uh, in people's uh, spiritual development. Hmm. Um, many of the Anglican religious communities who haven't got the, uh, the benefit of large historical resources are of course struggling as a result of the lockdown because their only source of income um, is mm. retreats and they have been closed now uh, for retreats for 10 or 11 months. I was, mm. I was at Mucknell um, on March the 17th last year um, and I, I was celebrating mass the first morning that uh, the cup was refused to people uh, present uh, because of Covid and within a week uh, the guest house was closed. Mm. Oh, thank you. That's, that's really helpful. OK, uh, we, we've got time for, for questions. Um, perhaps, Peter, you can give me a hand here, but if, if you can put questions in the chat or you can raise a hand or the symbolic hand also works. Um, you will need to unmute them when you do ask your question. I think that's it. Then. Thank you very much. So I'll hand back to Adam. So I would uh, just like to thank Mark for coming in and for giving us that uh, very, very enlightening speech and for, and for being so responsive in the questions as well. I mean, so many interesting questions coming in there um, and really sort of helping us to develop our understanding of this uh, new monasticism. And it's so relevant for us as we go into our next 50 years as the lay community to reflect on the lessons uh, of differing emerging communities like by the Hollywell community. So thank you so much on behalf of all of us. Um, I'd like to thank Mike, uh, Mike for inviting you today and for sorting today out with such uh, amazing speed and reaction. Can we all then just show our gratitude to Father Mark. Let's show a nice reaction of thanks to Father Mark for his wonderful speech today. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you.